And welcome back to Jeff Kinnagin live here at Citizen Television on the bench today. Decades and decades of experience. These folks here have served in various ministries and various administrations from Daniel Arab Moy all the way to President Kibaki. Imagine that. Chirao Ali Mwakwere served in five ministries. Whoa, five. <laughs> Lina Jabiki Limo did three. Yeah, and Dalma Sotieno did three as well in two administrations. That's a lot of experience, folks. Sit back and take a listen. And maybe you'll learn a thing or two. Welcome to the bench, folks. Thank, Thank you. Very Good very to very see you. Thank you. Mushma, do you remember which ministries? You, you, you served five ministries. Which ones were they? Ministry of Labor and Human Resource Development. Mm -hmm. And then Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Ministry of Transport. Ministry of Trade and Ministry of Environment and Mineral Resources. Which one was the most fun? They are all, they are all exciting to, to manage. Um, it's difficult to say which one was better than the other. Yeah. <laughs> there are challenges all over <laughs> and interesting yeah. in all aspects of the world. Mm. Yes. How about you? How, how many did you serve? Three. Three. Yes, uh, when we came in, I served under uh, uh, the vice president's office. Mm -hmm. uh, that was regional development. That was me and the late uh, Wamalwa Kijana. Yeah. Uh, when he passed on, then uh, Moody Awori mm -hmm. became the vice president. And of course, then regional development was no longer there. We went, I went to serve under him with, uh, uh, it was Minister of uh, Home Affairs. Right. Then the third one, was now when I think I had landed the ropes enough, I was told to start the Ministry of Immigration. Oh, mm. you started it? Yes, there was no Ministry of Immigration. It was started by me. Ah, yeah. mm -hmm. fantastic. Okay. Mwashmua, you served under two administrations. Yes. And three ministries. <laughs> and three ministries. Which were? <laughs> I started with industrialization. Uh -huh. Then briefly, I started a new ministry called Manpower Development, just for a brief period. Then I was moved to transport and communications. And then the last was public service. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the important thing is when I was under industrialization, yeah. I was also the chair of all African ministers of industry uh, by election right. of all the ministers. Across the continent? Across the continent. Then when I moved to transport and communication again, I go to Addis Ababa and I was again elected <laughs> <laughs> minister for two terms of transport and communications in Africa. Hmm. And similarly, with the Kibaki, I took public service. And you'll remember the emphasis then was performance management. Yes. Again, the African ministers said, I'll be their chairman. <laughs> <laughs> wow. To ensure the establishment of efficient and performing public services which investors need in all of Africa. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Yes. They recognize that in you all along. All along. Well done, well done, well done. What do you think of um, the, uh, the list of appointees by President William Ruto? What do you think? What are your thoughts? I'd like to congratulate him. He has appointed individuals who know what they mean by bottoms up. You know, they've been talking about it, they organize themselves, they have certain aspirations which their party believes will improve the lifestyles of Kenyans right from those who are marginalized to all others. Now I'm saying he made the right choice because they're the ones who understand the bottoms up concept. Okay, Moshima, your thoughts? Um, I take this opportunity, of course, to congratulate His Excellency William Ruto for the nomination of his cabinet, mostly because there are more politicians people who have been in their campaign trail, people who have interacted with Wanainchi. So they know where they are coming from, they know what Wanainchi want, and they know what they told Wanainchi they will do. So I believe they will be able to 
perform. Uh, you know, you just mentioned, uh, and I had a question uh, I was going to ask later on, but let me ask you since you mentioned it. Yes. There are more politicians than technocrats now. Yes. Why? Why do you think? Oh, I don't know why, but I think it is good. It is good because uh, politicians easily interact or they are not afraid per se, or they can easily be stopped by citizens, or when they stop, citizens will stop and say, what is this one telling us today? Because they have seen them in the campaign trail. Mm. Uh, Vis-a-vis uh, a technocrat now, who may be more into what is written, or you know, the, uh, translating what is written into a language understood by Wananchi can be a challenge to a technocrat. Mm. But uh, a politician, it's like, brings what Wananji have said and tries to squeeze it to fit into what is written down. Hmm. Yeah. Well, do you agree? Do you agree? <laughs> <laughs> Politicians have to make better <laughs> uh, In a way, it goes by the risk level. Technocrats tend to make clear-cut decisions yes. mm. where consequences are easily determinable. But politicians are able to go beyond by accepting risks that may not be that determinate, but can still be tolerated, handled, and absorbed. Yes. Mm. So that makes the difference between technocrats whose decision making is like, slightly to be restricted. And you need somebody who would be able to broadly make a decision based on the national interest at the time. And on that basis, it is the politicians who have the experience of doing so. Uh, all of us were technocrats mm. from the beginning. And uh, when you are appointed a minister, you quickly learn that one. That at that ministerial level, if it is just a technical decision, your principal secretary could do it because you have enough capacity, uh, technical capacity within the ministry to be able to do so. Mm. There's not much in terms of research. There are people who are doing those in the ministries. Right. But Jeff, when you know there is nothing issue... absurd in politics. Oh. While a technocrat is very careful, yes. but a politician, there is nothing <laughs> absurd. <in. laughs> so, they can say anything. Right. So when decisions reach the level <laughs> yes. where consequences would require political response, then you need the politician to be the C mm. CS to make those decisions. Yeah. Mm. And if consequences are of a political nature, he will have the capacity of mobilizing colleagues to achieve acceptance. Which okay. you, you st uh, go on, okay, you're saying no, something. No, 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 it's yeah. okay. Go on. All right. We should also note that there's a very thin line that one would draw to say this is a technocrat and this one is a politician. In many cases, it's just a question of uh, the role that one is playing and you decide whether one is a technocrat or a politician. The line is very, very thin. As Mwishimua Dalma Sotero said, <laughs> most of us were technocrats for years and years. And then we just decided to go for elections and were branded politicians. Where that technocracy disappeared is difficult to tell. But you realize that uh, the line that you can draw is that this is a Dalmas politician. Yesterday he was a technocrat. Now he's a politician. Is sometimes extremely difficult to draw. It's a fine line. So this dichotomy is misleading. What you want are people who can produce results. Good point. Very good point. Once more, you said a moment ago, um, by the time you got to immigration, you had learned the ropes. Mm -hmm. Some of these appointees are what you call greenhorns. <laughs> For lack of a better word, they're green or they have absolutely zero experience. How, how do they fit in the job? I mean, what's it going to take? Uh, I'll still go back to the fact that most of them are politicians. That means, though they are greenhorns, they are carrying the vision of the principal because they have been in the same movement, campaigning, saying this is what we are going to deliver and all that. So I believe that could be the basis of their first performance. Yeah, mm. implementing the vision. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's look at, what do we look at when we are uh, thinking of making somebody a minister? Uh, first, you need to know the president. I've worked with His Excellency in this case, 
since he came into parliament, I was already in the cabinet myself. He's a person with a vision, a passion, and a commitment to perform, to achieve results. So based on the presidential perspective, the president will look for people who are likely to deliver on his mission. Mm -hmm. So the first category would be people whom he already knows mm -hmm. in performance uh, areas, mm -hmm. who have been doing particular things in particular areas. And normally by the time you reach the president, you have been able to evaluate and look at so many personalities in different executive functions mm -hmm. in the political economy. So first he has that. The second is the personal capacity of the appointee in the cabinet. What can he do? Because once he comes into the cabinet, he will not just be looking at one thing. In the cabinet, we expect his contribution on all issues that may reach the cabinet, not just his portfolio or her portfolio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All portfolio ministers, you are supposed to help your colleagues on the issues that need decision at cabinet level. Mm -hmm. So you are not restricted to decisions affecting your particular portfolio. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the president considers the relevance of your experience and capabilities to the portfolio to which he wants to assign you for now. And of course, he always reserves the right to reshuffle depending on what you do. Right. Mm -hmm. By the way, how, how was your relationship with both Presidents Moy and Kibaki? How was it? Your for me to have been there for so long, you can be sure it was perfect. <laughs> 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 Always, yes. whenever there were these complicated issues and some analysis was required, leading to a decision to be taken, either at cabinet committee level or at full cabinet level, you would call back to me, what do you think mm -hmm. <laughs> about this? Yes. And you would not fail to get a good explanation in those circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> about yours, uh, uh, how was your relationship with uh... I served under only one president, yes. the late uh, Mikey Baki. And uh, I must say that my relationship with him was more like, more of a father-daughter because I was young. Yes. Yeah. And I think that is why I was put under, I was made a minister under the office of the vice president, that is the late Wamalwa. Then later on, still under the office of the vice pre president, uh, Moody Awori, and then later on now independent. Mm. Uh, I, I can only say that, and he was, uh, he was a very kind uh, person. Yeah. Yeah. And, but, and he was very hands off, right? He delegated. Yeah. Yes, mm. he delegated yeah. by appointing you. He, he, he expected the minister he appoints to deliver his docket, to perform to the satisfaction of uh, the party's aspirations. And I'll explain here. Mission. Ours is a political mm -hmm. government. Our governments have been political, and all political parties have their manifestos. Right. The agenda is the same to improve people's lifestyles in education, health, agriculture, environment, economy, and so on and so forth. Actually, it's the same. The modalities that they put in place to achieve what people are expecting to achieve, to define themselves as people who have developed further, is contained in the party's manifestos. Now, the people who are appointed are people who know what their manifestos um, have spelled out. They know how to interrelate. That's why it is even easy to transfer ministers from one ministry to the other, mm -hmm. because they all know what their manifesto has defined. And they're expected to be not the people who would really deliver directly, and this is one thing that people should really understand, because a minister is like a, a manager of, of a football club. He may not be good at playing himself, mm. but if the team loses, he gets sacked. <laughs> and he's expected to achieve results with people who can play. 
So a minister is like a super manager. He's given a team, permanent secretary and all those people under the permanent secretary. And he's expected as the minister to ensure that he achieves results from those people, like a team manager who is expected to achieve results, make a team win, and yet he himself may not be a player. He would even embarrass the team if he was to be given <laughs> a, <laughs> a, a, a pair of boots. <laughs> a pair of boots. Yes. Yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, another perspective, just to pick from where he has left, mm -hmm. is the fact that you are from campaigning and you had this manifesto and you know that you must achieve. One of the things that was expected of us is the president would ask, what do you think? You know where we want to go mm -hmm. and, you, and this is our agenda. Mm -hmm. What do you think? What is the best way? And one, one of the calls which was there during that time was creating an enabling environment for Wananchi to, to flourish and, and prosper. So what do you think? In this docket, what do you think in our agenda, in our manifesto, you can be able to do so that you create an enabling environment? So the challenge was always thrown back to us. And then now you have a challenge and say, I have to deliver on this manifesto. Yes. Yeah. What you, you're saying? You wanted to add to that? Look at it this way. In ministerial functions, they vary every time. In the productive ministries, they are usually reform areas that the policy direction requires new, creative, innovative ways mm -hmm. of doing things so that the country can be more productive. There are risks in engaging in certain programs mm -hmm. in ministerial mm -hmm. functions. Yeah. It is at the risk level that civil servants and technocrats are hesitant. So they need somebody who can absorb political consequences <laughs> to take shock action. Shock absorber. <laughs> like shock, shock absorber. Yes. <laughs> yes. To take action mm -hmm. that we are now going to handle this in agriculture. Mm -hmm. We are going to handle this in communications. Mm -hmm. We are going to pursue this policy in industrialization. Mm -hmm. Like now ICT has come. How much emphasis do we put in it? Mm -hmm. And if you do, what are the risks? Mm -hmm. Would there be losses? Would there be wastages? Mm -hmm. What are going to be the efficiency levels to be taken? The technical officers can summarize all this. Then the minister, with the capacity to absorb consequences, will say to end the mm -hmm. right? That is where the problem is. And that is where the personal capacities of the ministers are important in those productive areas where a decision will be made and it affects the entire society, not only now, but maybe several years yes, yes. As, as we go forward. Right. The question then arises whether the politician, whom we presume was also a technocrat on some, with some adequate experience before the president could place him in that kind of uh, position. We have to look at the whole country, like Kenya as it is now. The biggest problem is unemployment of the youth. And the solution is known. It is industrialization. Right. So it means capital generation. It means reducing consumption. It, redu it means enhancing efficiency and reducing wastage, stopping corruption and so on. Now, we would require ministers who would be firm enough in making those decisions and the public says, that is right, let our government go in that direction. Very interesting. So when picking the ministers, we don't want to emphasize individual personalities mm. once the president has already assigned them functions. Mm. We would rather look at the team. Mm -hmm. And there is a tendency to think of the team as having PhDs or that categorization <laughs> of Kenyans. No. We need people with experience on all aspects yes. in our society. Yes. You, know, you may get a PhD who doesn't know what Madare looks like. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> Yet decisions we are going to make, the policy directions we are going to make decisions on would be affecting 
those slums would be affecting the ordinary Rahia in the countryside. Mm. So we must always bear in mind that at cabinet level, we look at personal capacity and then group competence. And as a group, the president has done well enough. He has got a team that can deliver on the national agenda that Kenyans are expecting. Almost, are you saying that there are people who are schooled but know nothing about Madare? <laughs> so there are people who are only schooled but are not educated? I don't want to go into <laughs> definitions, <laughs> but I can tell you yes. <laughs> that uh, I can meet a chemist who was the top brain at the university class when I was there, and he had never gone to Madari. <laughs> he has no idea. There's no clue. <laughs> no clue. <laughs> that was just with a light attack. <laughs> <laughs> you see, when ministers are appointed, they are expected to advance or contribute to the achievement of the aspirations as spelled in the manifesto. Yeah. But one thing is important here, that these problems are continuous. There is no ministry that can say has solved all the problems as given at that moment in time. Problems of development are continuous and they keep on changing. For instance, at Independence, we are talking of uh, um, three, they were calling them enemies, poverty, um, ignorance, ignorance disease. and disease. Do you know those challenges are still there? And sometimes they get even more complicated. So a minister is somebody who should be alert and ensure that he guides his ministry as he responds or she responds to challenges which are mutating within the docket we, if you take the example of um, um, unemployment, that is poverty, in another word. And this unemployment is addressed in many ways. The education system, um, financial inputs to make people produce more, uh, looking for markets. So there is that interrelation between ministries. It is extremely important. Some people call it overlap, but it's not an overlap. You are trying to solve problems which are lifelong. Even great I'll countries you, have got the same problems, but they keep right, on mutating. The right, challenges right, keep on coming right. afresh. A minister should be alert and respond to that and guide his minister accordingly so that you achieve. The I can give you a practical example mm -hmm. in my own experience. Mm -hmm. I come and ask for a number of issues. Can you tell me what has been pending and why it has not no action has been taken. Mm. And every departmental head in the ministry, all top professionals, each of them would come with an issue. Then I said, I want the technical paper on that item. Mm. You'll find that technical paper is seven years old. <laughs> and it has been lying in their drawers for that time. Gathering dust. <laughs> Why wasn't a decision made on this matter? Yet it is important to Kenya. Yes over all this period. And what would the answer be? I mean, what, what would the... That is now the ministerial decision-making capacity mm -hmm. and ability to absorb the risks attendant yes. to the decision and the consequences of those decisions. You know, when we say consequences of a decision, you can make a decision, then Rift Valley would say, we are not happy. Coast will say, forget it. Central would say we must do it. Mm -hmm. Now, you see <laughs> why some of those decisions yes. take so long until you have the minister with the capacity mm. to put it as clearly, convince all the other colleagues to understand it, accept it, and agree to implement it, and then defend it within yeah, yeah. their regional areas where they come from. Right. So that way you start getting decision making that works. Not things that, the technical officers in the ministries, they have all these issues analyzed and even put in writing. Even gone through some committees in government. But because of different consequences that the issue would be affecting a large part of our society, you now would require a minister to go through all those issues 
and prioritize them. Set ones in I. Then we are following this. And I'm ready to convince parliament to accept it. Start, first, you start by convincing cabinet to accept it. Mm -hmm. Then you have to convince parliament to accept it. Then you have to convince the people outside there to accept it. And sometimes you have to convince donors to resort it, to resource it, if they can give you the funding for it. Sometimes you may need to bring in technology from out, out of the country. Can you identify it? Can you raise funding for it? And then finally, will you be able to manage it in a way that it works? Mm. Jeff. Yes. <laughs> you know, we have a very knowledgeable uh, civil service in this country. Mm. They are. The people we are referring to as technocrats. Yes. Mm. What they only lack is the risk, which we have also already discussed over here. Uh, and now, ministers who are politicians or cabinet secretaries who are politicians, it's like we go and give feet to these documents which these technocrats have written, they have researched those papers, but you see, they don't have a platform to speak it out. Uh, a cabinet secretary who is a politician, as I said earlier, can stand in the streets and one end you'll say, what is it? And then they're straight away you tell them what is the latest information that you've gotten from all the books that have been written and researched in, in, our, in our government by the uh, technocrats. So I, I believe that uh, what uh, uh, His Excellency William Ruta has done, uh, we will achieve a lot because there are more politicians who will then be able to tell us what has been achieved, what has been researched. And Wananchi are em impressive. I know they'll want to change. People always want this, that inert desire of any human being to change their position where they are to a better. No. So if only we are told this is the route. Yeah. To end EV. EV. Like now we've been told we need to learn saving. So the ministers should be training all of us on how to save, mm -hmm. for example. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which yeah. uh, Pre President Ruto held a, um, hit the, the, the last cabinet meeting with the old cabinet, two, I think two days ago, right? Yes. W w what is the handover procedure? <laughs> <laughs> is it? Watch a gari pale inje ama. Are we allowed to say pass to a question? Yes. Oh, you Therefore, want to pass? Pass. Peter <laughs> <laughs> No, I think the, but, uh, <laughs> the family. What, what happens here? Yes. There must be continuity. Correct. You know, even if it's a, a new government coming into office, there must be, it's not, there should not be a break. But there must be continuity so that people carry on um, put, making inputs, even if there are new team, not to start afresh or discover the wheel, but to ensure that uh, there is uh, a seamless continuation of activities, and in the process, they introduce what uh, they would like to take as a better change for the improvement of people's lifestyles. Mm -hmm. So it is important to have that uh, um, transition, not uh, to have a situation where people abandon offices, documents, and everything. It, it will be terrible. Yeah. And this has always been happening, by the way. Mm. Yeah. Are, are there uh, things like handover notes? Are there no, structurally, sometimes some ministers will do that. Structurally, the ministry continues, at least the departments. Right. Many times a ministry would be composed of three or four mm. uh, departments with experts as heads of those departments. Mm. That continues. Only the ministers and the principal secretaries change with the governments. And who are these experts? They, they, who remain? Who are they? The, technical, the civil servants the civil are there. Yeah. All the time, they don't change. Up, up to the director level, even some senior directors, mm -hmm. only the permanent secretary or principal secretary mm -hmm. may live with the president, mm -hmm. right? And then the minister. Right. So the rest of the public service is intact. Mm -hmm. And the new, the new ministers and the new permanent secretaries will come and find those people in office. Mm -hmm. However, a good minister will have certain issues to which he may wish to draw the attention mm -hmm. of the new participant. Mm -hmm. These would be issues, for instance, cabinet papers which have been passed 
but are but pending are implementation. Yeah. And the reasons why implementation may have been delayed or the risks that may be involved in that implementation, mm -hmm. whether it was financial, whether it was opinions of mm -hmm. other people or support from these other areas. That one, it is the retiring cabinet secretary who is likely to have the full perspective to brief the new arrival mm -hmm. on, on the matter. Right. On technical aspects of what you are going to get, all you will do is get it from the officers. Yes. When the principal secretary arrives, he will call all the heads in that particular ministry, summarize the issues as they are, and he would be the one who would brief the new minister fully on what he has got from the civil servants, yes. who are all technocrats. Mm. And as uh, Mweshmua has mentioned, we have very knowledgeable, very experienced civil servants in Kenya. That one I can assure you. Yeah. Because that's the first thing I did, having been in public service. I wanted to know who is who where in the entire civil service. Mm. And what are the performance standards? What are the performance targets in every ministry? And they had them at their fingertips. Yes. Mm. What if they don't like you? What if your staff doesn't like, you know how people are? <laughs> they just don't like, you know, the change or the new arrival. Mm -hmm. What do you do? <laughs> well, uh, it must be tough, yeah? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow you will still have to find a way. However, um, I must say that uh, changing from um, Uhuru regime to where we are now, because I also served in his regime as a chief administrative secretary, we did write uh, notes handing over notes mm -hmm. or what is, of what is pending, what in our perception we feel must continue for the benefit of our country. So those briefs are there. So anybody coming uh, to the office of my boss, uh, CS Professor Margaret Cobia, uh, they'll find all these briefs from the various state departments uh, on what uh, must continue, must continue that way. But however, if they don't uh, like you, uh, I'm just wondering what they can be able to do because wherever I went, I think I found people who, who, who liked me. But Jeff, before I leave, because I, I see us moving from uh, Manifesto and the politicians, I just want to give a glimpse of, so a glimpse of what Manifesto of uh, the late Mikey Bucky was. Uh, in his Manifesto, he talked about Marraquet and talked about the insecurity which was there. And so coming in as his cabinet secretary, though I was not in the Minister of Interior to see matters in security, I knew this is one of our manifestos, this is our agenda when we campaigned as NAC. And so I would use my time as MP when I'm in the constituency to ensure that peace between Pokot and Marraquet was created. And I go out of my way. You open markets. It was, it's something like trade, but I ensure that we are having markets, getting communities to talk, finding which are the ways which my president will be able to achieve his manifesto. And I believe that those who have now been nominated, one of the things they have to do is how do they ensure that bottoms up is implemented as they spoke out. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the things that a minister must do. Look at your manifesto in your campaigns and how do you contribute to implement uh, that manifesto uh, for example uh, one of the things was also about forest issues so many others so i believe that the incoming uh, cabinet secretaries have to go back internalize what is in their manifesto and find which is the best way for them to help their principal achieve that absolutely remember the, yes please all civil servants are non-political when you ask us the question, what if they don't like you? Yeah. <laughs> there is no issue of liking a minister. They are not looking at the personality. Mm -hmm. They are looking at the portfolio. The minister is minister for agriculture. And their job is to develop Kenyan agriculture. So most of the civil servants have no problem with the personality occupying that post of minister or of permanent secretary. They know those are posts which change with government based on new policies, based on manifesto, as Mweshmua had indicated. Them, 
is to facilitate the necessary performance mm -hmm. within the portfolio. And remember, we have long term like Vision 2030. Right. Mm -hmm. And we have five year development plans. And we have annual budgets mm -hmm. in which already even before the new team comes, we already have what government must do within the year. Mm -hmm. Then we have what government must do in the next five years. And what we expect the government to do in the next 30 years, mm -hmm. right? Like we had a vision 2030, which is just now 10 years mm -hmm. away. So liking is a political question and should not be applied <laughs> to civil servants. <laughs> oh. When it comes to liking, yes. you should be talking of MPs in parliament uh. who are concerned with political party interests. Mm. That is where you may not be liked and you can be roasted there. <laughs> Remember, he was the boss of public service. Yeah, yeah. All the civil servants were under him. Yes. Uh, yeah, so. All right, folks, we're going to take a break, come back and talk a lot. But this is really interesting stuff. By the way, during your time, you could be sacked on the one o'clock news. Yes. Remember? Uh, yes. We'll talk about that after we take a break. I'll give you the answer. Okay. <laughs> Keep tweeting, folks, <laughs> at Queen Anger Jeff, at Susan TV, can you the hashtag JK Live. JK Live takes a break. We'll be back in a moment. <laughs>